afternoon. Let's do a sound check and make sure the volume is okay. Hopefully it is. <clears throat> Angela, good to see you in the chat room. We are going to, you know what? Um, what a morning. What a morning. It's always good to spend time with the Lord in the mornings, it is. What a morning. We're going to go back to, we're going to be going into the book of Enoch. Now, I understand there are a lot of people here who have not read the book of Enoch or have read the book of Enoch. And now we're going to really get into it. It sounds like I'm in a tunnel, Swainbow. How about now? Is it okay? I did turn back the um, other volume there. So it should be okay. No background noise, you guys? Good to go? Everything good? Good to see you, Malachi and Mayors. Swaymo, of course, and Angela. Tom, good to see you. Captain Mark, God bless you. Birdman, Twitty, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Kitty, good to see you. Max, Pastor Scott, Jeff, everybody's in here. What are you guys doing in here this early today? What? I mean, everybody's in here. Okay. Of course, we're going to begin in chapter one. Now, for those of you who do not have a link, because our database is not quite ready, it will be ready upon the next study. In fact, it'll be ready Sunday. Uh, but we, 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 uh, you can go peer through there Sunday at a few things. Here is a link I'm putting in the chat room in case you guys want to go straight to chapter one. This is where I'm going to be reading from. Um, there's a link in the chat room. For those of you who are listening but you don't have access, don't worry about it because there will be access to the Book of Enoch on the site. I'm not going too far today, but the preface of the Book of Enoch is very important. And this preface uh, that we're going to discuss today adds to some, it, it will add and answer some very curious questions. In fact, in the, in the very first, in the opening portions of the Book of Enoch, it, to me, is quite astounding. It's quite astounding. And, um, oh, it's just quite astounding. And so we're going to go through and read this. We're going to read this. Oh, okay, Swainbo says she had two media players on. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So we're going to go through the book of Enoch. But first of all, since it is the morning time, let's say my favorite prayer, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. What does that imply? One day at a time. I love that prayer. It's, it's a perfect prayer. It truly is a perfect prayer. It truly is. By the way, I want to say something. Um, before I got on air, I was peering through some emails. And there's a very special individual. I want to tell you something. Um, they wrote me about their life, their own testimony. I want to say this. It's day by day. Provisions are always day by day. And the Lord will take your walk, and that is your testimony. That will soon be your ministry, is your testimony. That will be your service to the saints. It's not actually what you're doing and how people, they have uh, businesses and things of that nature. You think that supplies your needs, but no, it does not. What will supply your needs is the truth of your testimony. Day by day, we work up courage often. I say that collectively. Um, we work up courage, and we divulge the entire testimony without shame, without reservation, to demonstrate the true gift of the Lord. We do. And I'm telling you now, the, the, the uh, more tragic the testimony, the greater the power that testimony has. Also, because you have a testimony, and the Lord did bring you out, that is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because you believe 
that he died on the cross for your sins and you've reached a point of repentance, you will overcome all things of the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, which none of us deserve, but is over us, over us nevertheless. And the word of your testimony, which is Jesus Christ is Lord. And because you know that, you've already overcome day by day provisions. We'll be set. And speaking of provisions, I want to say thank you to everybody. We're on our last family. We're working on getting that straightened out. I will. I would ask for special prayer. This this last family is is um, they have children involved, and the Lord will certainly have to uh, work with some hearts, give the parents some understanding, and a little strength. Um, concerning their last matter okay and but you know what thank god for you all that we're able to assist in the lord's work in their life really really i can't talk about that too much it's very touching when it deals with children so back to the book of enoch we're going to read this preface you guys have seat belts on how many of you have read the book of enoch already how many I like to know that. How many people have read the book of Enoch? Because if you have, that's a, that's a good thing. Now, it's never, in, in this is just my opinion, it's never good to really read a portion of a book and then go into detail with one section because you'll begin to forget, forget about the rest of the, the precepts in the book. For example, if you watched a movie and you stop the movie halfway in the movie, and you begin to focus on one specific scene, are you going to know the entire story? No, you won't. You won't know the entire story. You'll know the details about one section. But not knowing the end of the story takes that small portion that you have out of context. Right? And when you take that small section out of context because you yourselves have not watched the end of the movie, you begin to imagine your own ending. This happens often with the Word of God. I always make it a rule when I'm reading. I, I never read a few verses. I'll read the whole chapter, right? And then I will go back. After I read the entire chapter, I'll go back. In the Old Testament, I have to read the entire book, and then I go back, right? I want to know the whole story. Then I go back and investigate certain parts. I have to know the whole story. I, I just thank God he gave us the entire story. That we may understand the whole story. And then go back. And conform to the areas in the story. And that's very important. Same thing goes with, a, with the, the book of Enoch. And the multiple books that are inclusive in the book of Enoch. His parables and, and uh, uh, some of the writings of Noah. And so forth and so on. And some of the writings of Noah are in the book of Enoch. You guys know that. Some of the writings of Noah. And it's very important to know how, what the Lord told them exactly, right? Because we have the general story of uh, these Bible books. They go back and tell the details, which are quite amazing. They're amazing because they complement the already existing Bible. They do not contradict. They don't. That's why they're amazing. And it's, 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 I tell you, there's a lot of conviction in here too. See, the book of Enoch will cause you to repent. That's what will happen. It'll cause you to repent. It'll cause you to turn away from sin quickly. It really will. It will actually make you, it'll make you say, oh my Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to play around. That's what will happen when you go through the book of Enoch. It will happen to you during this study. Some portions of it are not nice. They're just not nice. It's, it's, uh, in, in the sayings of it, it really brings to life a lot of what's said in the Old Testament, a lot, everything that Jesus said. And then you find out, oh, my Lord, I've been playing. Because the language used in the book of Enoch is very direct. I mean, it's very direct. So, in other words, if you're going to die and perish, then it's going to tell you you're going to die and perish a horrible way. You're going to suffer great suffering. Uh, it, it, there's no mincing of words. There's no sugar coating, and that's why I like it. It is straight between the eyes. But it does cause a great conviction 
all too often. We justify many things in our flesh. I, I, I tell you what, if you stick with us during the study of the book of Enoch, and as we're continuing in our study of the book of Revelation, it will bring to light all the words of Christ. Because there are great blessings in there he spoke about. He does not mince words in that either. You'll get excited in some portions. You'll get excited in quite a few portions. But you'll have the information, including the gifts of the Spirit, why they're there. You'll have that information. You'll understand the workings of the angels and what their actual jobs are. It places things into context so that you don't walk around confused, right? There's no confusion in truth. None. There's zero confusion in truth. You see, truth, there's another name for truth. You know what that is? It's called rest. How many of you know that? Truth is also called rest. See, when you know the truth, you can surely rest. It doesn't matter if the truth stands for you or against you, you can still rest. Knowing the truth is no longer having an illusion, no longer being part of a delusion. You don't have to guess and wonder what the outcome is because you have the truth and you know the outcome, which means all your steps will be good steps. When you already know the outcome, you don't have to imagine and guess about the steps you need to take to conform to that truth. Therefore, you can rest. But if you don't know the steps and you don't know the absolute outcome, guess what happens? You begin to imagine multiple outcomes. That's called confusion. You cannot rest. Your mind won't rest. Your soul is restless because you begin to try and conform to each one, but you don't know which one is true, which one you need to pay attention to. How many are with me on that? But when you know the absolute truth, there's but one outcome. And when you know that one outcome, your steps can truly be ordered. You truly do have a firm grip on great understanding because you'll gain it in the truthful direction, not having understanding in multiple imaginative directions unfortunately that's what that's what has happened in a lot of cases with the body of christ and many different things and it is because people believe in multiple outcomes there are no multiple outcomes there's but one outcome that outcome is the truth given to us by jesus christ unfortunately it's been interpreted by many people many different ways there is but one way right there is but one way one way and Jesus gave us that way he gave us that way that's why it's a good rule never to interpret what Jesus said but to accept it it already makes sense but the words of Christ do not make sense to your flesh they didn't make sense to the flesh of those who walked among them in fact people were angry and couldn't follow and they were saddened because they couldn't do what he asked them to do because they were firmly rooted in the flesh He's broken our flesh, and there's but one, there's but one way. That is Christ. In the book of Enoch, Christ is also spoken about quite a bit. The Christ is edified in these books, so, I mean, it's incredible. You'll understand the person of Christ. You'll see parts of the glory of Christ maybe you didn't see before. You'll see it. See, you know him as your Savior. You know him as the only begotten Son. But do you know him prior to all things being created? Do you know his special seat? Do you know that he stood where he stood prior to him even coming to earth, prior to the earth being made? Do you know he did that? And he was reserved for the sake of who? You. Do you know God had that in mind before any, anybody was created on this earth, before Adam, before Eve? God had you in mind. It also makes you just give up your hope of trying to understand the mind of God. It makes you give up your hope because you say there's no way. He, he is in absolute control. He never lost control. He knows all everything. <clears throat> we exist within him under his direct control. All situations are not out of control. He is doing something. See, the marvelous thing about the book of Enoch is it affirms the fact that God has always been doing something. He didn't have to try and do anything. Your entire life has been written out. And your life is going to accor according to the writing. Now, there are two directions in your life. But he wants you to have the good writing so he can throw away the rest. Because he gave you the power of choice. 
When you give someone the power of choice, they can create a new path in their life. Being a good father, God will often scoot you back to the right path. We interpret that here on this earth as trials and tribulations, don't we? Troubles in our lives. That's him scooting you back, but he never lost control. Satan cannot do everything he desires to do. God knew what they were going to do. Do you not know that he, it's almost like he kind of chuckled at the fallen angels. You see, because you think of death in the flesh as always oh, just the end, not the father. He didn't think of death that way. To him, there is no death. You came from him to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you don't, when a kid dies that way, that's what happens. There, there is no lost control. Everything is purposed. He gives humanity a chance. You're going to learn the true nature of the flood. Not so much the, the, the giants walking around and everything else, but the meat of the flood. If the giants were not so corrupted that they corrupted humanity, the flood would have never come. You, we, me and you, humanity in the earth. When we became corrupted, the flood came. Not because of the giants were here. It's when we became corrupted. And you'll begin to learn this. And it is beautiful. It really is. Because the Lord is looking at us. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at you. He's looking at me. That's what he's looking at. All things in this earth exist for who you the weather exists for you. The animals exist for you. You know why the earth is cutting up like it is now? If all things are sustained because of us, because the Father is looking at us, when many turn away from him, he's not going to sustain things but for a select few telling you the truth his grace and his mercy is sufficient for all life but mankind is finally turning their back they're turning their back on the Lord they're falling away from the faith left and right and because they're doing this he's not going to keep things think of it as a slow flood because mankind is getting corrupted but listen his eyes are still upon you see who he already foretold this before the earth was created he saw the time that we live in right now all the way up until the end before the earth was created in our feeble human minds we say well why would he even create the earth then ah see you're thinking from flesh you belong to him the earth belongs to him how would you question the creator of a thing and you are the creation how could you question the creator on why he did this or why he did that that's a lot of pride and audacity isn't it we shouldn't ask questions like that Isn't that what Job did Job said well all this suffering I'm going through why was I even born and then Job got chewed out did you forget about that in the book of Job it's almost like God said hold up stop your mouth you stop saying stuff did you create the heavens and the earth and the stars and of course he I'm paraphrasing he said Job you didn't create yourself I created you for the purposes that that suit me not the purposes that suit you you are here because of me you can either accept that you are my creation and walk in obedience to that or you can reject it and perish don't question me on who I allow to be tempted on who I allow to go through these trials and tribulations. Job, you can't think that far. And then eventually Job said, well, I came from the womb. And that's where I'm going to, you know, my life is nothing. He found out. Job stepped to a point where he stepped in his own pride and questioned God. Do you not know that you exist? All things exist for God's pleasure. Stop watching Hollywood movies. For his pleasure. Do you know that? Sometimes we get this wrong picture of God, and that's what throws prophecy all over the place. That's why we can't see prophecy as to what it is, because we try to humanize God. God is not human. God is far beyond what you can possibly can perceive, and you can't imagine what he really is. You know his small, small speckle. You know his representatives. You can't behold God and live. It would destroy your flesh. It is the origin of all life forms, all energy, all everything. You cannot do that. It is the mind of minds. It is perfect and pure. It is everything 
It is unseen and seen. How can you conceive that? So when we read through this book of Enoch, keep those things in mind. And some portions of the book of Enoch will absolutely condemn your flesh, but it's going to straighten out your walk. It will absolutely straighten out your walk. Some of you are going to sit straight up in your chairs. You're going to say, oh no, I've got to get to work. Let me stop playing in those things. See, a lot of us, when we speak of the work of the Lord, we want to work in accordance to what we want to do. Some of you are going to drop. You're going to throw that in the garbage can. You're going to throw all that in the garbage can. You're going to say, oh, no, Lord, you give me my assignment and let me work in the truth, not in my imagination. That's what you'll do. Many people work the works of the Lord in their own imagination. He has not assigned them to do what they're doing, but they're doing it anyway. And if you've assigned yourself something, you're going to throw it right in the garbage can. You're going to repent and say, no, Lord, this is no good. This is not what you called me to do. Lord, forgive me. Many of us are going to find out that we were seeking to do things for the sake of being accepted by somebody else and being known by somebody else. We did what we did for the sake of company because we were lonely. We do what we do because we seek to have a friendship with somebody else. Oh, we're going to find out some truths here. But the end of the matter is beautiful. Those of you who have suffered in the earth and you're very quiet and have held your tongue, you don't complain, but you truly do trust the Lord. And you in your hearts, you're discouraged in your hearts because of your sufferings that money can't fix. You have sufferings money can't fix, but you've held your tongue. The greater blessings are yours. You're going to understand why. You'll cry when you read certain portions. Your heart will be overwhelmed as soon as you have comprehension of them. It's not very difficult to comprehend. But the greater promises are yours. Because you truly stayed the true course. You see, there is a true course, and then there is the course humanity tried to make people believe. The true course, you have stayed. The true course. It's beautiful. So, without further ado, guys, let's start reading into this. Now, keep in mind, we're studying the book of Revelation too, right? This the first. This is the very first portions. And we're going to analyze it. We're going to read this thing and analyze it. It says, The words of the blessings of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the days of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Stop. I have to stop right there. Did, did you guys hear that? Did you capture anything in that? Anybody capture anything from that one verse? The words of the blessings of Enoch wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the days of tribulation wait a minute Enoch blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the days of tribulation hmm? Enoch Enoch and in the days of tribulation are what when all the wicked and godless are to be removed? Hmm. So the days, he just gave you the definition of the days of tribulation that so many people are afraid of. So many people are afraid of the great tribulation people have named it. I don't know where they got that from. The Bible says, Jesus says, then there will be great tribulation upon the earth, such as never once since uh, there was a nation until that time or, or the earth began until that time or will be after but during those days of tribulation if the wicked and the godless are removed at that time what are you afraid of you thought it was for you see that comes from a mindset that you've gone let me explain something to you you've gone through things in your life and you have been beaten down in your life and everything else you have felt pain in your life and everything else. That bred fear. Fear of ever going through that thing again. You went through that, didn't you? And when you say tribulation, you desire not to have it. Why? I'll tell you why. Can I tell you a simple reason why? Because your loyalty to Jesus of Nazareth is not strong enough yet. When you're truly loyal to the king, understanding who he is, you don't care what you go through. You don't. 
he becomes more important than your own life. But right now, those who want it don't want to, they don't desire to go through anything. Their life is more important than what the Lord sends. It's, it's that simple. Can anybody, can you capture this in your mind? Because if your life is more important than what the Lord sends you through, you're always going to try and get out of any type of anything concerning tribulation. But if the Lord is more important than your own life, you don't care what you go through. What you do is unto him, and you're no longer concerned about what you go through. And guess what? That is receiving perfect love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love does not come from you. Perfect love comes from the Father to you. You're not in a rush to, to jump out of anything. You're willing and have already given your life to Christ. You've given all of what you are to him for the sake of the kingdom of God. You can only do that when you understand it. And anybody who actually understands the kingdom of God will do it naturally. They'll do it naturally. Connie caught it. Connie understood. Well, that's one. One is enough. <clears throat> it says, and he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything. And from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. Concerning the elect I said and took up my parable concerning them. Semicolon. Stop. God showed him something for you. I think that's awesome. God showed Enoch. Listen. He said, he said his eyes were opened by God. He saw visions of the Holy One in the heavens. And the angels had shown him. And from them he heard everything. The angels interpreted everything. And from them he understood as he saw. But not for this generation or not for his generation. But for a remote one. One that's far removed from his generation. Which will come. He saw the visions. For the generation that will be living in the days of tribulation. And this book will be a blessing to those who occupy those times. It will be a blessing for those who occupy those Because it gives understanding upon understanding. It says, the Holy and Great One will come forth from his dwelling. And the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai and appear from his camp, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake. And great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Stop. That's powerful. Listen. The watchers. Watchers is a phrase assigned to those angels who are given charge over the earth. They're watchers right now. That's only a title. When the first watchers fell, other watchers were assigned. That's why you heard them in the book of Daniel. Didn't you? The watchers were in the book of Daniel also, right? A brand new set. Not Azazel and his crew. They were bound. But a new set were appointed over the earth. Right? But the watchers that fell. The watchers that fell, even the watchers that are here now my lord every body it, the watchers that were bound will surely be smitten with fear because it's their sentences coming up there's nothing they can do about it and they're quite powerful but they can do nothing about it they will quake and the earth and the, and, and the uh, uh, fear and trembling will seize them unto the ends of the earth that is a powerful statement have you ever been so scared that your, you, your stomach was bubbling or something like I have? That you feel like the, 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 all the feeling went out of your body and a type of trembling was in your body with a type of numbness and everything? I've been that scared before. I've been so scared that my hands would not move. I've been that scared before. That terrified. This is them. Upon the coming of the, upon the, coming of the Lord. Listen. His coming constitutes... The greatest fear because they stood against him and they know their sentence is coming. He's getting, you know, I was wondering about something. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. 
The Lord said that they're bound in the earth. They're bound in the earth, right? It's funny. As we get closer to the times where Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot, and all the signs in the earth, right? All the signs in the earth are corresponding to what's happening concerning prophecy of men. And it's almost as if if they shake, if they're in the earth and they're shaking, what are they doing to the earth? You ever think of that? If they're bound in the earth and they're starting to shake upon the arrival of our Father, are they disturbing the earth? Because those in hell, I believe this, those in hell, they can't do it. They're just stuck. They can't do anything. But the watchers are not bound. See, they're, they're bound inside the earth by great chains. And I'm just wondering, is there power? Because they're, they're bound because they're still powerful. That's why they're bound. But if they're starting to shake and quake, I'm just wondering, is the earth, because there's something about the earth and other objects you see out in space, maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't know. That's why a lot of scientists, even today, call them, they don't call them planets, they call them uh, uh, cauldrons. That's what they call them. They call them cauldrons, because they're wondering what energy is locked up inside these things. They call them cauldrons. So something is shaking, and it seems like the more prophetic things that come to pass, the more earthquakes and everything else we have. Now, scientists say, well, it's a natural phenomenon in the earth, right? But what causes an earthquake in the first place? The expansion of earth or disruptions inside of the earth. Massive disruptions are happening inside of the earth, right? I'm just wondering. That's just a thought. It says, let me continue. Verse verse, uh, 6. And the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. Now, of course, I have shared this with you. These are not physical mountains. These are not physical mountains. A mountain is a stronghold. The possessors of the earth. The high hills are in a like manner, the powerful of the earth. Okay, listen, and the high mountain shall be shaken. They too will shake just like the watchers, just like the ones who influence them the most. And the high hills shall be made low, right? High hills don't have as much authority and power as the high mountains, but they too will be made low, totally humbled before the Lord. And they will melt like wax before the flame. You're going to find out why. If they melt like wax before the flame, then guess what? They know nothing. There's no good for them. And the earth shall be wholly rent asunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish. And there shall be judgment upon all men. You see, folks, let me stop at seven. When the Lord does arrive, it's over. It's done. It's finished. There is no nothing. See, when he comes, it's too late. There's no prep time. They try to hide themselves, but still, there's no prep time. That's the only thing they can do. There's no prep time. It's finished. The Lord is coming. He's bringing judgment with him. There's no prep time. It says, let's continue, but with the righteous, he will make peace and will protect the elect and mercy shall be upon them and they shall all belong to God and they shall be prospered and they shall all be blessed And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. Did you guys hear that? It's a condemnation upon his arrival for those who stood outside of unrighteousness, standing within themselves, but with the elect, the ones who stayed the course in truth. He will make peace with them and will protect them all. So all these fallacies that other people have driven down the throats of other folks you can, because you have some people they just want it to be like Hollywood where everybody dies like Mad Max or something that movie Mad Max a calamity comes right that nobody really nobody's going to survive and it's going to be very difficult and hard and that's hogwash that is to assume the earth is out here on its own there is no God that's denying the Lord That's foolishness. They get those ideas from Hollywood. They don't get those ideas from truth. 
Because truth is not an idea. Truth is fact. But what side do you stand on? See, I like this contrast. I do like this contrast. So when we come back, we're going to take a break. I'll be right back. We're going to take a few breaks throughout this. I'll be right back and let everybody swallow this one. And I shall return right after I find. There we go. Okay. I'll be right back, you all. Okay, everybody back yet? Hopefully, everybody's back. I'm sorry, I got called out, had to run back to the other building to get back here so I could do some things, and that's the way it went. Okay, back to the book of Enoch. First of all, wait a minute. Somebody whack my things. You guys do understand that in the book of Enoch, in the preface of the book of Enoch, many things are told. So we're going to get into exactly what's going to happen. Um, as it as it says in the book of Enoch, I just it's exciting to me. It is, and I do so. I I do regret not having the uh, database of the book of Enoch ready for you right now, because I have two slides, two slideshows actually, um, that I can go through with the book of Enoch. So listen for the next study coming up for the book of Enoch. I would rather. I, uh, hopefully, you guys have a device where you can actually go to the. Uh, Bible study section of the site and it will be ready Friday it's not ready right now on Friday so that you can actually go through the slides with me right because I can post things in there and you guys can see them right all you have to do is look at the page that means a lot of people won't be chatting much because you can't do both at the same time that's okay because I'll be talking and going through slides and things of that nature we will eventually Angela and I and some other folks are going to get together and make an actual um, probably make a, a video of these study sections also so it will be in video form and that will be on YouTube so you guys can see exactly what we were doing so I think that'll that'll be good for you guys too uh, certainly good for me uh, because I want to put everything that I have in this study because it's so incredibly, it's just so accurate. It's, I can't explain that enough. It is the most accurate. And so as we get this, as we get this done, we're going to be on to something. I, I tell you what, guys, you guys give me two more minutes. Let me get this other page back up here because I can't see it. About two more minutes and I'll have this other page back up and we'll, we'll, um, get back on course here let me pull this up it's going to take me two minutes because i lost it i'm going to bring it back you guys stay put right there just for two more minutes bear with me ladies and gentlemen we are back thank you lord that worked okay we are back we're we're, we're good to go back into the big book of enoch sorry about that break i told you guys as soon as soon you know what i'm going to do something i'm going to have to find a uh, go under the bushes that way Everything will work fine when you're in the dirt, right? No distractions, no anything else. That's how that'll work. But we are back. So let's get back to what we were talking about now. So everybody is on the same sheet of music here. At the time of the coming of the Lord, the wicked will be shaken terribly. Shaken terribly. But the righteous, he's going to make peace with them. Peace with the elect. He'll make peace with the elect. He will help them all. He will be there for them. Here's why you don't fear any type of tribulation. It's because you have to have an understanding of this process is echo throughout the word of God. Upon the coming of the Son of Man, upon the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is the judgment, yes. It is the condemnation of those who stood apart from the Father. But it is the absolute victory for your life. Also, this will help you to operate in this one preface can help you to better interact with folks in the world. And let me tell you how. Do you see where it says, all the high mountains are going to be shaken, all the hills made low, and they're going to melt like wax before the flame? The earth is going to be totally ripped right and all upon the earth shall perish listen and all that is upon the earth shall perish and there shall be judgment upon all men and then it says but with the righteous he will make peace so at this point you're not accounted 
among all men. Right now, you're not accounted among all men. Not in the context of this. You're the righteous and the elect is what you have been becoming. I hope you understand that. At the time of the demise and the shaking of all mankind, the destruction of mankind is truly your redemption. That's why you shouldn't fear the end times, but think soberly. Don't try to escape anything because you're not going to escape. There is but one way of escape. You know what that is? To entirely give your entirety of your life to Christ now. To give your life to Christ now. I don't just mean to declare him as your savior. That's not, listen, you can declare him as your savior and say, Jesus is my savior. No, no. How are you living? That is your actual declaration. Do you not know that your true declaration is not by your mouth, but by your life? Do you know that becoming one of the elect, they have special characteristics? Do you know that? They are named. And before you think it's everybody who conforms to certain things in the Bible that you've read, you're going to have to hear out certain lessons in the book of Enoch. You'll find out who they are. It will give comfort to the suffering. It, it does this. It gives comfort to the suffering and condemnation to those who have been in comfort. I'll say that one more time. It gives comfort to the suffering and condemnation to those in comfort. That's what it does. Enoch says this book, he was anointed to give this book to who? To us, the remote generation, who will be living in the days of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. When all, all of them are going to be removed. First and foremost, in your walk, is that your neighbor, the people you see, not be accounted among the men that will perish. If your heart desires any man perish, you do not have the heart of love in you. And the heart of love is the heart from the Father. If you desire that a man perish, you're not sharing the heart of the Father. Clearly in the Word of God it says, God desires that no man perish outside of him. If he desires that no man perish outside of him, but if we desire that a man perish for their sins, we have entered into premature judgment. And we will in our lot stand in the place of judgment with all men that will perish in the end. Which means this is going to refocus your walk in truth. When that happens, all of what you need to continue in that walk will be bestowed upon you. Whatever gift, whatever power. To complement the walk, because you're walking in the way of Christ, will be right with you. You see, when Jesus walks with you, everything you need is with you. What I mean by walking with you, is when you walk in the path of Christ, you truly do represent Christ. When you truly do represent Christ, you truly do represent the Word of God. And when you truly represent the Word of God, you'll be lacking in nothing. You will accomplish the task that the Lord assigned to you. Not what we have assigned to ourselves. There are a lot of cases where people have genuine hearts and they say, hey, this would be a good idea to do for the Lord. Well, that's one thing. But I'm talking about your calling, what you've been born to become. And when you walk in the way of Christ, you're truly an ambassador, a representative of Christ. All the power will be with you and then your desires change because you'll be walking in that path of Christ as a representative and when you say something then when you declare something then when you touch someone then there's a departation of truth and you may touch one and hundreds may feel it but your walk will be in the steps of the Lord, not in your own steps. We always wonder where the power went, don't we? Well, the, well, does not God watch over his word to perform it? 
And if he watches over his word to perform it, which means God's word will come to pass in this earth. And we just simply have not been speaking his word in his way, in his timing. Because we're walking in our own footsteps and not the footsteps of Christ. To be an ambassador is to be a representative. To be a representative is to have the mind of Christ. To have the mind of Christ is to walk by the word of God, which is Christ. So everything is Christ. The word of God is Jesus. Many people don't know that. They don't know that Jesus is the word of God who dwelt among men in the flesh. Of course, it had power and authority because God watches over his word to perform it. But you've been given power to also become sons of God. To be a son of God is to also be a joint heir with Christ, which is also to have the word of God in your mouth. To walk in the path of the first and only begotten son, the first of many brethren. And if you're a brother of Christ, you're also what? A relative of the word of God. And if you're a relative of the word of God and you have the mind of Christ, then truly you're family. Because families think alike. Families. They do. They think alike. And when you're walking in this earth and the word comes out of your mouth, God will watch over his word to perform it and then your walk is effective. Your walk is very effective. We need this in this earth today. Right? You guys remember Zechariah 5.1? You guys remember that? Before I go into this next part of Revelation, let me take our, our uh, uh, book of Enoch. Let me read something to you. Zechariah 5.1 says, Then I turned, lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and I beheld a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof is ten cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off, as on one side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off, as on that side according to it. And I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter into the house of a thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof, and the stones thereof. Hmm, that can't be good. Now the part that should, that should really capture your attention, a caution piece, is the, are the ones that swear falsely by his name. What is that? Swearing falsely by his name. Lord, forgive it. You better thank God for Jesus of Nazareth. Because that's when, with our impure mouths, say that something was God when it was not. That's when, with our impure mouths, speak of our trials with a falsehood, like the devil did it, and now you know that the Lord sent it. It's with our impure mouths that we say something was a blessing and God never said that and you end up regretting that blessing which means that curse has entered into the homes of those aren't you glad you have Jesus of Nazareth because if we didn't all of our homes would be consumed we did steal we stole many things. We, did we not steal the hope of someone by making fun of them? Did we not steal? Hmm? We stole. Did we not swear falsely by his name? Didn't we proclaim something of God that was not? Didn't we, didn't we add to our truth of something that happened in our lives and it never happened that way? We surely swear falsely by his name. That is to say, you're saying things by his name. Without Christ, you are in this curse. Thank you, Lord. Because with our impure mouths, with our impure mouths, we surely have said harsh things against the God of gods. King of kings and Lord of lords. We have sworn falsely. 
We have been thieves and robbers. Only by the blood of the Lamb, only by the Lord, God's loving heart to send His only begotten Son for our sakes, are we redeemed. It is nothing that you can do to undo what you've already done. It is only the blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of the Word of God, to be trampled underfoot and destroyed by men. God allowed his word to be torn up, destroyed by mankind. In the old days, they used to teach you that a man is his word. God sent his word to earth to be killed by man. To be trampled, dishonored by men. Was that not the most important and closest thing to the Father, His Word? He is pure. He needs no substance. He is absolute and His declarations are sure. So He sent that to the earth to be killed by men as a sacrifice to us that we won't die by our words. My Lord, can you see the importance of Jesus of Nazareth? That's why we shouldn't play with our salvation ever. Never take it lightly. Be mindful of it always. Every breath you take, that brings a hope into your body. You should be mindful of the Lamb of God. Set aside and prepared. Since the beginning of all time. For our sakes. Because we can truly. We can't make it without him. We're cursed. We're cursed. Get out of the mindset that somehow you were born pure. You were not. Get out of the mindset that somehow you've done things right enough to set yourself above your brothers and sisters. We're all under the same curse, the curse that's on the earth. Be humbled before the Lord. Lay yourselves down before the Lord that you may stand up in Christ and in truth. And surely this is a perverse and wicked generation we occupy and we live in. Don't let that be a catalyst for you to exercise flesh. Let's continue to read this. Again, but with the righteous, he will make peace and will protect the elect. And mercy shall be upon them. They shall all belong to God. They shall be prospered and they shall be, they shall be blessed. And he will help them all. And light shall appear unto them. And he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. And to destroy all the ungodly. And to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness. Which they have ungodly committed. And of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You see, every, there are no idle words. There are none. We forget about people's words. But they're being made fat for slaughter. And during all this time, many have looked at Christ in absolute wrongness as an excuse to stand above another. Here's a sad fact. Many looked at Jesus to make themselves feel okay, to clear their conscience. And they go out, they stay in the world again. Many did not see Christ and fall to their knees and not enter back into sin again and those things again because it wasn't serious enough for them. now 
now through the Lamb, now through these days, the majority of Christians look with judgment in their eyes to others saying, they see in their hearts they're going to see, they're going to see, and I tried to tell them, get that out of your heart that you tried to tell anybody. Every Stop, get that out of your heart. It is not by your word that anybody is going to be saved. It is by them understanding who the Redeemer is. When you, when you went to the altar and you gave your life to Christ, you did that in view of men. But there was a special moment in your life when the story hit you, when you were by yourself. That is the moment you gave your life to Christ. Because in that moment, your heart was hurting. You realized what you did in your life. And you said, Lord, forgive me. Please forgive me. You weren't jumping up and down. You were not happy. You said, Lord, forgive me. No one witnessed that with you because it hit you when you were by yourself. And you found out that you were the one that pierced him. That's what you found out. That you were the one that pierced him. That you did the same things the Pharisees did. That your life didn't measure up. It, you know what? You, 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 there are many of us, over the course of time, we find out our life does not measure up for him to sacrifice his for us. And it will send you directly to your knees. Now, how does one not change after that realization? You know that without him, there is no you. You know that without him, you have no identity. You have no place anywhere. You know that without him, death awaits you. That you deserve the fiery depths of hell itself. You know that without him, you are truly nothingness. And what lifts your heart, though you can scarcely accept it, you believe it, but it seems, and so you're unworthy, you're just not worthy of his sacrifice. That keeps you humble. You don't want to take it for granted, and that keeps you in meekness. When a man believes he deserves something, he will always judge another. When a man believes he deserves nothing, there is no judgment in his mouth. When we feel we are owed something, we become pious. When we feel we owe everybody else everything, you truly do. You kneel in meekness before the Lord. Hmm. So you see our servitude, though it's been a little off, are you not even grateful that the Lord would send many of his many people who have found out things of which no one has ever heard before Many of you, things are being revealed to you, the truth of Christ, the importance, not the stigma and the popularity, not the populist view of Christ, but the truth. You know, the part that nobody publicly speaks about. In the world they say, God will give you everything. In truth, the Lord said, if you have my mind and if you truly do belong to me and you walk in the kingdom I'll give you everything you need to complete my task I've given you do you see how that works that's why he sent his disciples out with nothing he said don't take anything with you why because on the path of Christ it looks like you have nothing but he supplies you everything far beyond the mindset of humanity do you see how that works 
God gives provisions daily. He never stores up anything to, to bundle people with all the time. You, in a like manner, the same way. Some of you are not allowed to walk like you want to walk. And you have truly surrendered to have his mind and to walk like he walks. And then, in that, you saw the miracle. In that surrender, you see the miracle that to become like Christ is to truly trust in the Father. <clears throat> the book of Enoch complements, enhances, and shows us, I, there are so many things in the book of Enoch. The preface to the book of Enoch is amazing. Not to mention, he is the one. He blessed the elect who will be living in the days of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless are removed. He did. And Enoch was taken up to God. Interesting, isn't it? He was taken up to God. He was taken up to God. The only one that was not taken up to God was who? Moses. Moses was not taken up to God. Right? He wasn't taken up, but Elijah was. Now I say Moses because they saw Moses. The disciples did. They saw the likeness of something that looked like Moses. When Christ was transfigured. Elias already came back. That was John the Baptist. And the world didn't know it. Because the Lord works in very simplistic ways. What were, what were the characteristics of John the Baptist in the first place? He did prepare a way. He turned the hearts of the children back to the father and the father back to the children by preparing the way. He already came back. That's been fulfilled. Many people are still waiting on that to be fulfilled because they don't accept John the Baptist fulfilled that. Jesus said he fulfilled it. Jesus sat there and said he fulfilled this already. Elias has surely come. And they chopped his head off. See, Jesus already said that. Do you see what's happening here? This is, and the book of Enoch, oh my goodness, it, it begins to enhance things so that you don't go off in your imaginative world trying to imagine Jesus as you want to see him in your own comfort. Lord forbid us to ever do that. I don't want to imagine Jesus the way I want to imagine him for the sake of comfort in my life. Forget that. I don't want to have happiness in the world. See, I require the joy of the Lord, and that's only found in truth. It's not found anywhere else. The joy of the Lord is knowing the story of Christ and the beautiful gift he gave. Once you accept the gift he truly gave, you don't need any other gifts. Men who look for other gifts never accepted the first one. If a person looks for other gifts, the first one didn't mean too much. Mankind has a bad habit. It's like a child. You give a child a gift for Christmas. Six months later, they want to know what other gift they're giving because they have long forgotten about the first gift. Well, let me tell you something. The gift that Jesus gave is a gift that when it enters into the heart with the right understanding, it is a gift that is an eternal gift. Every day that gift is before you. Every day you'll be thankful for that gift because every day you realize that you fell the day prior. The truth of Christ is to understand that you fell yesterday. A man that understands he falls does not defend his own ideologies. A man that feels he has never fallen will defend his own ideologies. Why would we defend our own words when we stand for the Father's words? We need not defend the words of our Father. He looks over his word to perform it. There's nothing to defend. The word will stand, the true word stands as a testament to someone or judge against. Why do we need to judge? We've entered into places we shouldn't be. It's time for all of us to come home.
this book of Enoch will open up many things. You'll learn things like you learned in Isaiah when you found out that the Lord does not like wounds. He said that wounds in the book of Isaiah make the whole head sick. He doesn't like wounds. People like talking about their wounds, don't they? They not like wounds. He doesn't. We're going to find out many things. I just think, you know what I do? I'm so thankful for the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ that when we read the book of Enoch, you'll see for yourselves. It'll begin to do things. Now, the next step, having, having read the preface, it's time for us to see what the angels were actually doing, what, you know, what the angels were doing. We're going to go through the story of the angels in the study of the book of Enoch, not for the sake of the sci-fi stuff that you've read, but what you're, what you're under the influence of now, this section, when we go through the angels, is going to cause many people to not want to hear anything else of the study. I, I'll tell you the truth. They're, because people operate based on the teachings of Azazel right now. They do. People operate on what Azazel taught, Semyaza, what he taught, Arakiba, all these guys. They're operating on what they taught. And they don't know it. All of it leads to vanity. But they're practicing it right now. You're going to find out exactly who it was in the garden. Yes, it was a Satan. That is a race. Do you know that? It is a race of whom Lucifer, we're talking about one third of his angels. So when they do something by proxy of Lucifer, guess what? It is Satan, is it not? Now you're going to find out the who's and the why's. You're also going to find out what's speaking into your mind when corrupt things enter into your mind, where they came from. These seeds have been sown into the earth. Remember the wheat and the tares. The seeds that are sown into the earth are mindsets. We have adopted the mindset. Mindsets that cause a person to want to be right. I can tell you right now, I don't want to be right. I desire that my King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus of Nazareth, my Father in Heaven, be right always. Forget about my words. I desire he be right. Forget about everybody else. I desire that he be right. I do not desire that a man be right. I desire that the Lord be right. That includes me. I don't desire that I be right. I don't attempt to be right. I echo. I'm like a parakeet. I echo what the Lord already said. How about that? I'm a parakeet. You can believe the words that you can confirm from the Lord. Anything else is from the flesh. And you better take anything from the flesh with 17 uh, convoys of salt. In other words, take it in very slightly. But let the, words, let the words of the Lord take precedence in all things in your life. Don't ever let man's words sit above your father's words in your life. Don't ever do that. That's a big mistake. Big mistake. But we're going to learn about the pact that they met on Mount Hermon. The nature of the fallen angels that were the watchers. You're going to learn how they love their sons, which is going to reveal an iniquity working in the world right now. You're going to know why they protect bloodlines, foolish as it is. You're also going to learn there's no power in preserving a bloodline. Zero. There's zero power in preserving a bloodline. You're going to find that out. All the elite that preserve a bloodline, that, that's foolishness. And in fact, it was foolish in the beginning. It's foolish now. And God already foretold they would do this. You can learn the harsh, harsh truth about those who say they believe, but in their life actions and in their hearts they do not. You're going to find out about those who just came to the Lord and why the Lord's bestowing upon them such knowledge that causes the older person in Christ to become uh, just angry. Have you ever noticed the, the, the one who studies the word the most, they also get angry the most? Have you noticed that? The old ones, the ones that have been studying the word for 40, 50 years, and anger is beginning to overtake them. They become angry at many things. Have you ever wondered why? And the joy of the Lord is bestowed upon the young ones. Right? See, the old ones, God gave them a caution. 
And the young ones, God gave them a caution. And the ones in the middle, God gave them a caution. He also gave them advisements. We're going to read through those too. There's a reason why people argue over doctrine. It is. Because it does not come from God. You can't argue if both doctrines are exactly the same. And that only happens with the true doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His words. The book of Enoch makes, makes something known to you so well. It is this. The words of Christ should be above all things in everybody. You're going to learn this and you're going to be amazed. You will be amazed. No one should ever put any of the words of the prophets above Christ. They only, listen, these were men who were receiving of God parts of a whole story. But the actual word of God is Jesus of Nazareth. And this is why men get away from the New Testament. They can read the Old Testament all day. They can go research other books all day long. But they cannot stick with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that is where the power is. And it should be above everything everybody else ever said. But it's not. You're going to learn about one of the fallen angels. Who set a seed of denial in mankind. And they don't even know it. That's called witchcraft. To make a man deny the words of Christ through the words of God is wicked indeed. That's what's happening. They deny Christ through the words given to man by God himself. They do it every time because they keep edifying the words of the prophets. But they will not edify the source that gave the word to the prophets. Do you not know God spoke God spoke the words, gave the words to the prophets, and all of them foretold about Christ. Do you know Revelation is Christ? Revelation is Jesus. How many of you know that? Revelation is Jesus. You get to see who your Savior is in Revelation. And believe me, it's all about heavenly business. There are no games and playing in Revelation. None. We're going to learn those things. But the preface is beautiful. Now again, I have to tell you, I'm going to have the, we're, we're, we are likely tomorrow, you're going to see the database of Enoch, where you can actually flip through the certain chapters and things of that nature, uh, in the Bible section. So if you go to, if you, to get acquainted with that, go to councilstime.com, go to the Bible section, uh, and then those tools in the book of Enoch are going to be there where we do the presentations for the study. We're coming up with a template so we can do all the studies that way. But some of you guys are eventually going to be doing Bible studies in, in Council of Time also. You'll be doing Bible studies. You, you just didn't think I'd be here doing this forever, which you know, I can't do that. I'm, I'm to set a table. Angela and I set this table uh, for various different things. Now, she'll be on far longer than I will, but uh, we set this table. We set this table for others. You know, all we're doing is setting a table. And then others will come in and stand in the foundation of the house that's already built. That's the way the Lord designs things. It's time for us to live under truth, right? We have to live under truth and live in truth and accept that truth. Don't get mad at me when the fallen angels, women, I'm telling you now, women, do not get angry when you learn of things of the fallen angels. You're going to find out why there's male and female other than cre uh, procreation, right? Yes, you have offspring. But you're going to find out about what it is to become one flesh and what that actually is. You're going to find out why marriage was instituted by the words of the Lord. And we're going to tie it in with the rest of the book. Because so many people have put their own definition and spin on couples on wife and husband. It is just incredible. They have incorporated philosophies into the pure word of God. That's what they did. They didn't do that by the word of God. And a lot of women are going to find out they're following ways of Azazel himself. So don't get mad at me. Just understand how you're living your life. That's all you have to do. Understand. Understand. But there are a lot of things that have been missing. And see, here's, a, here's what uh, I have to share this with you. 
when something is not understood by the Spirit, when the truth is not there, mankind, they fill in the blank themselves. That's where you come up with many different uh, doctrines, many different ways something could work. Don't give me the many different things something could work by. Why do you think something was installed? I want the words of the Creator. The Creator is the one who designed the entire thing. So I don't need a, psych, a, a psychologist, right? Philosophers and all these other folks to tell me or to advise me, well, it could be this. Don't give me the could be's. We don't have to have the could be's. We are children of the Most High. We don't have to have the could be's. We can know the truth. And believe me, that truth will make you free. Because once you understand, oh, you walk, that's more freedom added to your life. Listen, the more truth you have by the word of God, by the spirit of truth, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all that comes through him. The more you have of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the more liberty that's in your life. Because you begin to walk with the spirit of the Lord upon you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that means where the spirit of the Lord is not, there is bondage. There's confusion, captivity. Of course you're going to be hateful hate, and, and oppressed and depressed and everything else. Because your mind is going in a thousand different directions. This study through the book of Enoch is going to complement so many things. Some of you are going to wake up, but you will sit up straight in your chairs. You will. So the first fact we learn in the book of Enoch is this. In the days of tribulation, the elect will be cared for by God himself. The unrighteous will be destroyed. That means the elect have to be here. During the days of tribulation, the process, the wicked and the godless are going to be removed. This also can show you why wickedness and iniquity will flourish near the end time like it is now. It, it, it will flourish. Listen what happens when Wickedness is not seen. You guys ready for this? I'm going to tell you what you do when wickedness is not seen. When I say you, I mean people who believe in Christ. When wickedness is not seen, when it's hidden, right? You will defend it. Because you don't know that person has that wickedness in them. You will say, well, and if I could see the wickedness, but you can't, here's what you would do if you didn't see it. You'd tell me I was wrong. You would chastise me. Because you didn't see the wickedness. See, you only see wickedness when it bites you. That's when you see it. Otherwise, you will embrace the vessel of wickedness itself. You'll embrace it. But you only really acknowledge it when it bites you. When it bites you, you say, oh, that's really wicked. But if it does not bite you, and a person points it out, you'll chastise that person. That's why Jesus said, don't sit there and point it out, because that's how people, Jesus told us this, by the way. People will react based upon that. They'll point to you and chastise you, having no understanding, because you cannot judge something in view of other saints and not cause confusion when they have no ability to see it. You would begin to tear down the house. Because you did something premature. Therefore, judgment comes at the end. When wickedness and iniquity is revealed so that you see it and when their demise comes you know if a person who's wicked and when they die you are truly saddened if you knew the extent of their wickedness and iniquity and they were given over to it then you have understanding and that strengthens you that strengthens you see death often weakens people in other people's lives it's because they don't know the truth when a person dies and you know the truth it does not weaken you. It strengthens you. You understand the process of death. And therefore, guess what? When you're strengthened, sitting in the middle of a funeral, guess what you become to everybody else? You become a comfort to everybody else. If you yourselves are weakened in that state, you can't comfort a soul. You're no good to comfort anybody else. You'll mourn with them. But when you have full understanding, you become a comfort to those who mourn. Does that make sense to anybody? So then the truth will allow you to stand in the capacity as an ambassador, certainly in times of great trouble. And the Lord will have you. He's, you're going to understand. 
so that you can comfort my way of truth, not fiction, not imagination. Somebody else. See, all of this was designed already. All things are working according to that design. God created the design. He didn't alter it or anything else. So everything mirrors everything. Do you not understand this? Everything mirrors everything. Everything mirrors. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The processes used in the days of old are used today. Because they're God's processes. You all see how that works? This is why we have to get back to the truth of the word of God. Because I don't know if you've noticed. But wickedness and iniquity is beginning to flourish. Beginning to flourish. And as it says in the psalm, it is because it's going to be removed forever. And if it's removed forever, that is the coming of the Lord. Don't fear the tribulation. You have work to do in the tribulation. You have work to do. Don't spend your time judging. Don't do that. Because you do that prematurely. All things have not been revealed yet. If you're, if you're, you are deemed this harsh, cruel, and everything, nobody's going to listen to you. You can't be effective in somebody's life. Few words is what we need. Not many words. But our life in general is a demonstration to everybody who views our life as the word of God. What did we see Jesus do through his word? We saw him teach. We all saw him operate by principles of the highest virtue. We saw him chastised and crucified by men. And we saw him being raised from the dead. See, that became the hope. Your life's the same way. Think of this for your life. You have been chastised. You've been cast away. You've been pierced in your side too. You've been close to death. But what they need to see is you coming up out of that death. That is their hope. Their hope, the people who are watching your life, their hope is to see you come up from that place of death. In other words, your life has to look like it's going to go kaput so that the people around you will have hope through your victory. Through your victory, they will have victory. See, you came, through, you came to Christ because of his victory, believe it or not. You came to Christ because of his victory. If he had not been raised from the dead, no one would come to Christ. They would have simply mourned him and said, well, we don't know what to do now. Don't let your life be that way. Stay the course. Because your life is ministering to many people. Hang on, but hang on for the truth, not for the imaginative things. Don't imagine who God is. Don't imagine who Christ is. You don't have to imagine. He can surely be seen by the events in your life according to the word of God. It's a perfect match. So finish the process, because for some of you, those folks who scoff and look at your life, they also need to see your resurrection in Christ. That's what they need to see. Your situation, some of you, is dead on purpose. So that the Lord can lift you up while they're watching. But he's only going to lift you. You need to stay the course. So they say this person is truly a Christian. And look how bad they're suffering. And when you're suffering like that, be a person of few words. Rely upon the Lord. Because mankind has failed you on purpose and they're still watching. That when you are redeemed in that sense... In that situation, they will look at you and they will say, that was only Christ who did that for them. They used to pray to Christ. They didn't move left or right or anything. Nobody would help them. You know that was not man's power. They will see your, your living testimony. And they will come to Christ because you stayed the course. Many of you don't know you're being used as an entire ministry. And you barely know a soul. Isn't that funny? We have been looking at things the wrong way. Those who scoff you 
are those who need to see the redemptive power of the living God in your life through Christ? Like Paul and Silas. What happened? What happened in the midnight hour? When the angel set them free, when, the, when he shook that jail, was not everybody free? Hmm? Listen, when the Lord steps into your life after you, but you have to stay the course, why would he deliver you if people are seeing you complain and murmur and curse and do all manner of things in your troubles? You're not representing the kingdom. To represent the kingdom is when you stay the course with the Lord in your troubles. You stay the course. You're not whining. You're not complaining, but you're depending upon the Lord. And they say, well, you're just foolish. Go do this or that. And you say, well, I, gotta, I, I believe in my Lord. And, and whatever he has for me, that will be. And when they say the final words, oh, you're foolish and you did all this for nothing. Look at what happened to your situation. And the day it folds in is the day of the resurrection. Are you kidding? And when they see the resurrection, those who are meant to see it, will fall to their knees and they'll say I want that too and that comes from God you will truly be a representative of Christ if you stay the course they will see the Lord bring you out of impossible situations over and over again but you have to be willing to stay the course if you veer left or right that's misrepresentation why would the Lord deliver you in his awesomeness upon your life if you did not represent the kingdom? Through you, his power can be demonstrated. Through you. When Paul was being whipped and jailed, do you know how that encouraged others and he stayed the course? He had to suffer things for the sake of the Lord because they were watching everything that he did, his life and everything. If you're a child of the Most High and you were truly called, then stay the course that the word may be complete in your life. Stay the course. Stay the course. He's been doing something in your life and your whole life is purposed. The entire thing. You'll see some of that purpose in the book of Enoch. You'll read every word of Christ differently after this study. You won't pass over the words. You'll eat the words. You'll say, I need all of his words. And I don't need the world's interpretation. It's about refinement. Truth is refinement. It really is. Folks, for the sake of time, I'm going to say God bless everybody. I'm going to be back on around 4.30 or 5. 4.30 or 5 today, okay? I enjoyed this time. This was the preface of the book of Enoch. Just so you know, the Enoch studies are going to be every Friday morning here at COT. Right? Not every day, every Friday morning. A lot of material I'm putting together for the, the uh, Enoch. And um, it'll be every Friday morning. You guys will be able to read along with me, right? And um, because we're going to go with it in this study. And it is for those who will be living in the days of tribulation. Now, I'm not the only one doing an Enoch study. I'm, just, I'm sure other people are out there doing an Enoch study. I kind of let you know the timing we're living in, right? Because Enoch is not a popular book, book and nobody in the right mind is going to sit there and go in there and say, yep, we're going to have an Enoch study. Can you imagine what people are going to say? He's having an Enoch study. Has he lost his mind? That book is not real. They saw all manner of things. Right? But I don't operate by the spirit of men. It is by the spirit of the Lord I desire to do things. Because I don't even accept my own thoughts and thinking. I don't. I cast them down before everything I cast down before the Lord. But when the spirit of the Lord moves within you, you, you just really have no fear of anything. You go with what he tells you to do. You will cast down everything of yourself. You know what the proof is? It will bear um, it will bear fruit, pure fruit. The fruit, the fruit 
the fruit, when you see the fruit, when the fruit takes place, and Jesus is edified beyond your, beyond your own thoughts, well, then you'll see. Because anything that edifies Jesus of Nazareth, right, has to be of him. Not in the way that we want the good stuff for us. But when you get bad news in your life and it causes you to refine it and you say, thank you, Jesus, when the bad news is for you, you know it's from the Lord. Forget about the good news. What about the, what about the condemnation and all that in your flesh being you get squirmy? That's what I like. The word of God will refine you. If it refines you, it's not comfortable to your flesh. It is not agreeable to your flesh. It fights against the mindset given to you by the world. That's how you know it's of God. So that we will see. Thank you, folks, for joining us today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me. And, uh, oh, also, now I have to talk to Angela because she's going to be doing some morning time uh, studies also. She's very meticulous in her studies, have you guys noticed? But we're going to learn some things. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to, it's, it's, uh, it's going to get fast and furious. We're not going to be taken too much by the events of the world. I thank God for Pastor Scott. Uh, for the praise and worship. I, I, I thank God for pastors like Pastor Paul, who keeps you guys updated on, 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 on uh, world happenings and things like that. I, I thank God for so many people because all these elements are necessary, right? I thank God for pe- folks like BB Earthwatch, who watches uh, certain things. The Lord has surely placed that in his heart to watch certain things and to do certain things. That's awesome. I thank God for those folks. I'm not a person who looks. I don't look like other other people look for errors in other people, right? That's foolishness to me. Because I have error. All of us have errors. You have errors too. But the point is, this is not about how perfect we are in saying what we say. This is about the truth and refinement. That's what that's about. Not so that we can be on top of the world either. But so that we can be true ambassadors to Christ. That's what it's about. Oh, I get excited. Let me stop getting excited. Okay, guys. I'm going to say God bless each and every one of you. And I shall probably return about four, four uh, f- well, let's just say from four to five, okay? And with that, that'll be fair. From four to five, sometime around that time I'll be on. Okay? God bless each and every one of you.